Olá, é, meu nome é Francisco Brito Cruz, sou diretor do Internet Lab e aqui para mais uma entrevista com acadêmicos que o Internet Lab está procurando, acadêmicos especialistas em temas de política de internet, em políticas de internet. É hoje a gente vai falar sobre direito ao esquecimento e eu tenho aqui é, a Julia Pauls que é especialista no assunto e vou fazer a entrevista junto com a líder, líder de projeto do Internet Lab na área de privacidade e vigilância, a Jaqueline Abreu. É, vou começar aqui fazendo a pergunta para a Julia em inglês. So, uh, Julia. In one of your interventions in the public debate about the right to be forgotten, you affirmed that, quote, America may look back at its condemnation of Europe's data protection rights of one of the moments when we lost our way, unquote. And recently, a team of researchers that is also uh, uh, have one of a public figure in Brazil, Virgilio Almeida, which uh, is a former uh, chair of CGI, Uh, this group of researchers uh, uncovered the possibility of re-identifying people who have the made de-indexation requests, undermining, quote, the spirit of the Court of Justice of the European Union legal ruling. So, how do you understand the relationship between these issues and your conception uh, of what would be a right to be forgotten, and which disputes and interests are involved in defining the theoretical, theoretical limits of this new but impactful legal concept. Thanks, thanks very much, and really nice to be here with you both. Um, oh look, it's great to have an opportunity to talk about that um, recent paper. So this is a paper um, by Virgilio, a team of researchers at NYU, uh, China, and uh, in New York. And I got a lot, lot of coverage out of a New York Times cover. I actually spoke on a panel at the CGI annual seminar with Virgilio and also the lead um, counsel for Google about this. And I think it's, it to some extent, misrepresents what's really going on with the right to be forgotten. So one thing about that study is that it looked at 283 URLs, which is a very tiny sample of the URLs that have been requested. There's been now 1.46 million. So we're talking about a sample set of 0.017% of those requests. Um, and they were a particularly biased set, as well as I think having some problem with statistical representation. They were also quite biased because they were compiled from lists republished by British news organisations. And for some background, I have worked um, at The Guardian. I'm quite familiar with the British media scene. Uh, and those organisations that have republished the lists have quite some animosity to this ruling. They have animosity at two levels. One is they, of course, being... Um, part of the fourth estate, interested in bringing truth to, um, in truth to power and everything. They want to make sure that the public record is maintained and so they're concerned about the, the sort of fundamental basis of what they perceive to be um, the right to be forgotten. Here the forgotten language is quite controversial. The second dim dimension I think that's really interesting behind their position is that they feel quite disempowered in the whole process because how Google, and we'll hopefully talk about this, um, has implemented this um, European uh, right to be forgotten is in a way that doesn't engage in any way the publishers. And so what Google does is makes a decision based on a request from an um, internet user and then it, after having made a decision, sends no information about the ruling but it sends a URL to um, the newspaper. And when that first started happening, I was um, with some of the first requests came to The Guardian and the BBC And the reporters were up in arms because there were these stories that are being removed from the internet. They quickly actually stepped down from that position. So it was James Ball at The Guardian and Robert Peston at the BBC. And they realised that it wasn't the subject of those stories that had made a request. But in the BBC case with Robert Peston, it was actually a commenter on a story who wanted to have that story delisted so that one comment he'd made ten years earlier didn't continually appear at the top of his search results. So um, if, if we then go back to this study by the, the NYU researchers, what they were trying to show was that there's a problem with how this right is being implemented. And they're also criticising the decision to, of Google to issue these notifications. And I think that what they missed in that is that part of the issue is that it disempowers publishers and it leads to misinterpretation. So I had actually looked at many of those links myself previous to this paper and 
identified who was the subject of the news story. It's not. It's a trivial process, in fact. If um, the whole point is that a person who makes a request, they're named in a story. So if you have the URL, they're not removed from the story. They're removed from the Google's index when you search their name. So if you look at the news, you type in the URL and you type in each name in the story and you'll reveal who the person is. So I don't think it was surprising at all that the researchers were able to re-identify, as you say. And in fact, they should have had 100% re-identification. And the fact they didn't, I think shows a major problem with this republication of lists, which is that the news organisations are possibly don't have a fully um, public intent in this. They are making a political statement. And in particular, a number of those links have been reinstated. So there were a few from The Guardian um, that were subsequently reinstated. And I was involved in the process at The Guardian to decide that actually we wouldn't republish the links. Because as the webmaster said, there's some quiet pathos in those links. And what they showed is that the individual, perhaps you had two or three links of an individual person's life unraveling, um, who has subsequently built a new life. And what the real purpose of the, this set of rights, um, I think misnamed as the right to be forgotten, is that we can move on from our past effectively. And it's not about people. If somebody is a public figure, if the news is relevant, they cannot claim the right to be forgotten. It's not for those people. It's for somebody like an incidental commenter. It's another example in Virgilio's study um, was a, a, a gentleman who every time you search his name, um, there are s news stories that say the word rapist. He was in an apartment where a rape occurred. He was not involved. He's innocent, uh, completely uh, has never had any criminal history and now is Clearly, you know, you see that by affiliation, you, you would have some reservations about hiring this gentleman. And so it's for somebody like that. It's particularly for people who don't have a large public profile, whose information uh, is information in perhaps a high profile news story or in, an, in something else which is indexed high in Google search results, continues to affect their lives. And so what they are forced um, to confront then is this sort of perpetual present of past information and I think a good way of framing what we're tr what the intention of these rights is is that we will still remember of course we can't actually forget um, and we don't want to forget we want to build on the memories of um, what we've learned and so on but that you can um, remember without constantly recalling not being confronted continually with past um, uh, incidents in your life and particularly when really the basis of the right is that information which is inaccurate, um, no longer relevant, no longer timely, and has no public interest, can be removed from search results specifically on your name. Julia, as you anticipated, the most uh, remarkable and well-known uh, case about the right to be forgotten is the Costeja versus uh, Google Spain case decided by the Court of uh, Justice of the European Union in 2014. Uh, having this in mind, um, uh, what have been the main outcomes and conflicts that arise from this uh, decision in Europe? And uh, despite Google's own interpretation of this decision, uh, what, in your own uh, opinion, in your own view, uh, do you think is the most appropriate way to uh, handle this uh, request, this, this de indexation request? And uh, what do you consider is the best way to? Um, um, uh, uh protect the interest that the, the court decided to want to protect? Yeah, so it's been super um, intense, the implementation of the right to be forgotten. There have now been over 500,000 Europeans who have made requests to Google through a form it set up one month after that ruling. So it, Google moved swiftly um, in, in taking on the obligations that it had under this ruling. There are actually some far broader consequences, I think, in terms of what this European ruling said about the application of laws 20, year old, 20 years old to companies like Google. They have so far been relatively scot-free in the um, data protection ecosystem. And one of the potential reasons why they moved so swiftly with the right to be forgotten was to stop any potential thought about what other elements of the core legal finding, which is that they are a data controller, subject to all sorts of obligations, including, for example, prior to a request in fact, considering data protection obligations. And there's various legal issues, think really interesting research questions around that. But so they implemented fast. The information that they gave to the public, I think was um, 
quite limited and potentially misleading. So, so they triggered what was, I think, a, a largely unproductive debate at the very beginning, which was that, oh, look at all of these criminals and public figures and politicians who are um, raising concerns about the right to be forgotten. And indeed on their transparency report, which they commenced about four months after they started implementing, they used, they cited some examples of cases that they accept and reject, and they were predominantly scenarios with of an individual who was a public figure, criminal, and so on. A a, um, based on uh, some work with a data scientist, Sylvia Tittman, uh, we did a story in the Guardian a year after that, which disclosed that based on actually an error in Google's own um, behind its transparency report, the source code revealed how Google itself had indexed these requests and it showed that less than 5% of requests, let alone those that are accepted, come from these categories that they had given prominence to. So I think that totally skewed the interpretation people had that this was, and, and quite rightly we would have great difficulty with the idea that people who would be able to repress information that is of public interest, that is about criminal records and so on. In fact, what it allows is really an alignment of what happens online with what happens offline. So the cases involving criminals who do have a right to be delisted are those who meet local laws about rehabilitation of offenders, say. Past crimes, they've served their time, or perhaps they were accused of a crime, subs subsequently were acquitted, and the information continues to percolate without, because of course news being as it is, the news story of someone being accused is often far more interesting than that they are acquitted. So, it's a it's a f I regard um, the delisting rights to delist. I think is a better way of interpreting this particular variant. Perhaps we will talk again about the other other types of rights under this brand of the right to be forgotten. But the particular one in the Google case is a r right to be delisted. Um, have certain information delisted that's inaccurate, out of date. Um, and no longer relevant and not of public interest. Yeah. So that's how the implementation has been to date. Uh, in terms of you asked how could we do better with this, I actually um, think there, there would be really great scope and um, some of the discussions with the local representative Goog of Google here were quite productive, but great scope for more um, nuanced solutions to the issue of somebody's results remaining high in search. So for example, you could just move it below the first three to four pages of search results. However, these people often don't have much other information, so there isn't a third or fourth page um, about them. But there's ways of, for example, having notifications back to the archive of those news stories. Perhaps um, tools to pseudonymize names after a certain period of time. That's something that's pra practiced already in um, media in different countries. And I think one really valuable component, if, if Google had been more transparent, after that study we, I, I mentioned where we found that 95% of requests were personal, we then, uh, I, along with a, a consortium of academics, made a number of requests to Google to say, can we segment the types of inquir requests you're receiving and therefore how we might consider the legal response to them. Because under the right to be forgotten, you have everything from, or right to delist, you have everything from someone's medical information that's online to potentially controversial cases with a news story, for example, where there's also a competing free speech right. And we should totally separate them. Google actually separated one category out, and I know this connects to the work of Internet Lab, which is the revenge porn category. So they didn't connect it to the right to delist, but after eight months of enforcement, they announced global delisting of revenge porn requests. And that is the sort of approach I think would be really helpful. So we segment okay, you, you have a broader category. At the moment, they only basically do fraud or um, uh, they, they don't even do things like, in particular countries, it could be very sensitive what your age is or what your, your religion is. Um, so a broader set of categories that are sensitive and that if somebody doesn't want, because um, you know the core of this is the information about me sh I should be able to control when it's not of public interest and there's no competing right. Um, so those categories would be useful to delineate and then I think if we did that we would be left with a small proportion of the cases that really do involve publisher interest, going back to that question about the, the genuine interest of these media organisations ensuring that this, the hard work that they do continues to have an in impact and perhaps a public-private partnership, um, Virgilio I think supports this idea and there's a lot of support from um, for example David Hoffman at Intel 
um, and many researchers in Germany to the idea of a public-private partnership that would look at the requests where there's a genuine conflict, where Google doesn't have experience, where there's case law that might differ between different jurisdictions about the clash between, on the one hand, freedom of expression and um, data protection rights. So I think a segmented approach would be really beneficial, as well as perhaps what this, this the, the resounding cry of 500,000 plus Europeans, and I think global citizens, is that it's not good enough if Google can sweep the streets of the web and put whatever they find online, no matter what purpose somebody put that information on. You know, think of a, um, an ex that wants to get back at you and put certain information online. Any manner of reasons why people will put something online, there's no friction to that. And some tools to really get back a little degree of control on that, that vast sweep. So the third question is, uh, by implementing the right to be forgotten provision established by the Court of Justice of the European Union, Google find initially limited the de-indexation to national domains from where the request came, such as google.de or google.fr. And in a second moment, it expanded the, delist the delisting for a geolocational uh, pattern or, or model. Um, currently, the company has been arguing with French authorities about a possibility of worldwide de-indexation. And I would like to, to ask you, how do you see this dispute? And when it comes to a removal of intimate images, as you were saying, uh, or the removal of copyright content, Google seems to have a different approach to that. Uh, to what is delisted and how is the jurisdiction problem is addressed? And somehow, by deeming Google responsible for making decisions about the right to be forgotten, the development of its standards became part of the company's own policies worldwide. So how it relate with uh, the thing that I said before. And how do you access the decision of putting online platforms such as Google in the position of making such decisions? Okay, thanks. So I'll, I'll separate out probably the territoriality question from the um, private decision making. So Google likes to talk about its solutions of particular variants of its index as territorial. Um, they, they are in fact um, tailored solutions to particular geographies, but they don't match um, legal borders necessarily. Um, th so this, this is a, a bit of a... Um, lightning rod debate on a, on a bunch of other issues that Google is concerned about. In particular, and I think it, it is legitimately concerned about, how it can ensure that it um, complies with laws and, and rulings that are really addressing properly founda founded legal rights and other situations where the law could be abused and, for example, the public won't have access to information and so on. So Google is constantly aware of the broader implications of how it responds to particular legal requests. This issue, personally, I support a geolocalized solution to a lot of this, but I actually think that it depends, again, one of the ways that we can penetrate this, um, what seems like border disputes, is to make it human. You know, that's something Google has been very eager not to do. We don't talk about the people's requests. We talk about borders and laws and clash of jurisdictions. And if we take it, we go back to the people, we might say, well, look, if your case is about revenge porn or if your case is about medical information that should have never been online, are you really telling me we have to have a geolocalized or local solution? No, I think we should have rights that um, are effective wherever you're coming from. Other cases, it may be that a local solution is enough. You know, somebody might be affected just by the proxim that information within a particular context. Think of a school kid, you know, and the way that that information from their schooling time can affect them later on. They may not worry about it later. You know, you're particularly sensitive to things at a certain age. So I think that if we segment it, we might find, um, and this is actually put in really nicely in a paper by um, two researchers from the Catholic University of Leuven, um, Brendan Van Alsenoy and, um, and uh, one of his colleagues, and they put the argument based on public international law that you can um, just, you need to look at the particular rights and that you would then get to a position where some rights are global and many are geolocalized and there may be some where country specific um, is appropriate. So that that's my way through um, that mess. I personally think that 
I understand the, the position of the, some of the European authorities, particularly the French, which currently has leadership of the um, European data protection agencies, to say, look, we're not going to just take Google's ver version of territoriality. We're going to look at real um, proper implementation. But I think that what a big problem for the DPAs is that they, like us, don't really know what these cases are about. And I think before they start telling Google to do it globally, we need to know what those cases are. Because there may be some of them. I think that Go Google has no interest in delisting information that isn't strictly within the bounds of the law. But it would be nice to know, right? I mean, that's that's what everybody's concerned about. And I lay that firmly at the feet of Google. Um, in many of our inquiries, they say, we simply do not have this information. And I fail to see how the world's self-proclaimed organiser of information can't s s do something um, which is between 20 odd examples on their transparency page and 500,000 requests, some, some more granularity. So the other question you asked in addition to um, territoriality was about this sort of Google being the decision maker. And this is really, I think- But X an example for any kind of private yeah. company exactly. making decisions. And this is such an interesting one for those of us who work in tech policy because Google on the one hand is saying, we shouldn't be the decision maker and on the other hand is doing this in a totally opaque fashion. They're not inviting in any independent authorities. They're just getting, you know, they're doing it. My personal view is they perhaps didn't know what they were getting into. At the beginning, maybe they set up a process, they didn't think about it too much and they were being a bit facetious and said, let's see what happens. We'll show you what happens when we delist. And then everyone was like, actually, this is good, you know, and now they're stuck with it. I think that there's um, there's a there's a really strong paper I read from uh, a Chicago Kent professor Edward Lee, who said that actually the scale of a lot of these requests, if we can if we can have clearer categories, and when you're dealing with decisions that don't have a subjective component, like revenge porn, like medical information, like a whole bunch of that sweep, that sort of you know in, uh, indiscriminate sweep that Google does, if we can have some um, specified categories, I think it should be private enforcement. The, the na nature of data protection law is if you collect the data, you have an obligation to do, to do so responsibly. And you have an obligation to meet the interests of data subjects in their own information, that it's properly processed. And that's including this reprocessing. A big distinction that I think some, that Google has been interested in, in muddying and many scholars have muddied as well, is that there's a separation that the actual persistence of information in the public domain is a separate thing from its proliferation in search results on Google. You know, Google is not the internet, Google is not the public record. The proliferation of information so that it's perpetually present is the specific issue that this Costea ruling is addressing. And the other suite of issues about information, and public domain and, and so on are, are quite distinct. Julia, you just mentioned that there are different kinds of requests that are branded as right to be forgotten uh, claims. Uh, at the end of 2014, the Brazilian Constitutional Supreme Court um, announced that it would decide to right to be forgotten cases. Um, both cases were requests uh, to television stations um, not to broadcast TV sp specials about famous crimes occurred decades ago. Uh, the claims stated that those facts were not relevant anymore and that it would only hurt uh, the dignity of those people involved. Uh, in the first one, the family of the victim claimed that the exposure was baseless and th that the case was not relevant anymore. In the second one, uh, the defendant was uh, acquitted and uh, which based his claim that the re-exposure could um, cause him an unjustified harm. Uh, there are um, were also arguments uh, making parallels with the logic of the criminal justice system uh, in which after a person is freed of charges or after a period of time following certain charges or a crime, uh, their records are clean and the, their past is no longer considered relevant to the justice system. Uh, however, those cases uh, do not involve the internet environment, uh, even if some new sources do not uh, make this distinction. Uh, is there a difference between claims should be forgotten online and offline? Right, so um, this is really interesting. Separately, across the planet, um, countries with a civilian um, law tradition have 
developed out of um, personality rights, dignity and um, intimate intimacy and so on, uh, these cases about what they call, I think it's droit d'oubli, it first came in France, right to oblivion here, um, and that's what these two cases, the, the global cases I think you're referring to, are, are about. They, um, they are as they've, they're of separate legal origin, which is interesting, to the Costea case we've been talking about. The Costea case comes out of um, data protection rights to rectification um, uh, and to erasure, which are part of data protection laws. More than 100 countries in the world have them. Uh, Brazil may, at some point, uh, have them. You have some of those rights, but probably not a strong rectification right. So that's statutory based, and this is um, constitutional law or other basis in rights of dignity. Um, I don't think. I think so. If they're in theory, you could have those rights that apply equally to both the offline and online domain, whether it's case law origin or statutory origin. Um, so I don't think there's a distinction there. There is a distinction in terms of what the um, how extensive the um, data erasure is. So what the intention of the um, online search engine specifically requests is, is to I introduce an element of, obscur of ob ob obfuscation and obscurity to that in information. It remains as ever in the public record, but it's about the continued um, prominence of information. These requests, as I understand it, are for that information not to be um, again given uh, some presence in an original source. And uh, the cases uh, which were decided actually align the, the STJ decisions that these are, that are now being appealed seem to align with my experience of other countries, which is, that for example, a gentleman who was um, charged with a particular crime that now they're revisiting and acquitted of that crime uh, s sought not to be requested, uh, not to be mentioned in the story, and then when he was, he um, sought compensation. And he was successful in the STJ. I would expect him to be successful in the Constitutional Court because that story didn't need him. And he had no, um, he had every legal right not to be mentioned. He was not, not a, um, uh, at all involved in the proceedings up after that point. The other case is, again, and it's quite similar. This is a Cooney case. It's quite similar to cases in other jurisdictions, which is the estate of an individual. And there it's, um, it's a different scenario because the individual was, has, was the victim who, who was killed in a um, crime uh, and it's the family not wanting to revisit that information. And this is kind of gives an example of some of the overreach people are concerned about. Some requests, for example, of a, a couple that divorce and the proceedings, which are very controversial, maybe they don't want their children to see. So they're worried about a particular audience, but then they have this wide reach. There are ways you can deal with this. So, for example, criminal and divorce cases often don't get indexed. You put robots.txt on the information. Then you don't need to remove it. You just stop its proliferation. Um, I think that the Cooney case is like in the SDJ, it was rejected. I think it's probably likely to be rejected in the Constitutional Court. The interesting question will be whether the court, um, conscious of the debates about um, this other brand of delisting rights and the popular um, conceptions of the right to be forgotten, seeks to make particular distinctions in that vein. Um, because there is a, they may start to get into the debates and maybe the media will be very conscious in, um, and global will be conscious of representing the very public interest style arguments. But I think that particularly for the gentleman who was acquitted, that is a core um, uh, right to oblivion case. Of course, you can't remove the news reports from 30 years ago, but you can stop news stories that continue to harm somebody who really wants to just move on with their life and has every reason um, to do so. So uh, the next question is also about our local or at least regional context. Mm -hmm. Uh, in Latin America, uh, over the past decade, there has been a uh, heated discussion about the need of restoring the memory of what happened here during dictatorship periods, uh, in which some countries suffered from heavy censorship from some people that were subjected uh, to serial human rights violations, such as unlawful and organized torture and ex executed execution practices. So many victims and their families seek rec recognitions of these facts. However, in the eyes of some legal scholars, and I s quote one, uh, the professor Eduardo Bertoni mm -hmm. from Buenos Aires, 
Um, so these legal scholars, those they they may see that those demands are in conflict with the amnesty uh, given both to the state violators um, and to the underground political organization outlawed at that time. Those these orders uh, say that the European uh, decision is export exported to the rest of the world would run against this movement of recognition and uh, of building a right to memory or right to truth of what happened before. Um, and this is an apparent, apparent tension with the public interest in accessing information, freedom of expression and transparency in the face of the right to oblivion or something like that. So what about the right to memory? Uh, how it can be uh, reconciled with the right to be forgotten, for example. Right, yeah. Well, so I think this is really important because I, I have. I think that this framing of forgetting sets us up then to say, what about the right to memory? And I think that we, you know, memory is the foundation of humanity. We absolutely need to remember. Um, I think, though, that that's probably... we if if we're talking particularly in this search engine context and so on, I would separate memory from what's on Google, for example. Um, I am v I'm very aware of the different um, different historical um, environments in which this, dis this debate is being discussed. I think it's really important that um, in Brazil, in Argentina, that the discussion is owned locally and it's considering um, the particular, the, the robustness of the legal machinery, the robustness of the tools, and particularly here, the the, the core um, uh, lever that we have in the right to be forgotten is the public interest defence. So people who have been granted amnesty, there is a continued interest, public interest in those stories being told. Invest, you know, the understanding. It's that there, there's a particular legal restriction on what can happen to those individuals. Doesn't stop you investigating. Doesn't stop you know a continued. Um, rigorous journalism and so on. So I think that that is not at all in uh, a conflict with rights, data protection rights, and particularly rights of delisting and so on. I, I don't see personally that conflict. I understand that depending on the strength of the legal machinery and the people who are implementing it, it could be misused. And I think that's why we need really strong safeguards. We need transparency about how the right's being applied, to what cases, and then you can you can safeguard against some of these potential abuses. Um, research from Internet Lab suggests that courts have been very differential to reputational rights such as honor or and image uh, when it comes to freedom of expression here in Brazil. Uh, politicians represent um, a third of the plaintiffs in civil cases involving online humor. Uh, usually suing users um, for damages. Uh, in 50% of these cases, um, courts have sentenced users to pay damages considering that they uh, that the reputation of the politicians uh, had been harmed. Um, meanwhile, numerous bills that have been introduced in Congress rely on reputational rights uh, as a foundation for uh, implementing the right to be forgotten. Uh, using broad language uh, such as outdated or irrelevant information, these views might open um, the gate for a flood of uh, lawsuits from politicians seeking uh, removal of content that might hurt them in the future um, elections. Uh, considering the stance that courts had been taken in such cases here in Brazil, what would would you say are the main things uh, to keep in mind when thinking of legislation to implement uh, a right to be forgotten here in our country? Yeah, well thanks. This connects a bit um, to Chico's question and I really commend that work that the Internet Lab has done. It's fantastic. I think that sort of, it's exactly the sort of contribution that we need, that empirical, rigorous, largely independent view on everything um, is really important and then we can actually see this. I, again, it goes to the lever of the public interest, right? Because my conception of the right to be forgotten is that these politicians are not even in, they're not even in the running. They don't even get up because there's a public interest in, unless the information, and we must concede that there are some components still of a politician's life that should be private, but it's not anything to do with anybody's opinion about them politically. That is open, open for the masses. That's how it should be. And that should be, if anyone tells you that the right to be forgotten is something else, then they're missing the point. I do think it's a very it's very interesting what you say about this um, the 
the regard had for um, personality rights, reputational rights. And this is something that I think scholars who are looking at the right to be forgotten from context where this is foreign, so the UK, Australia, Canada, um, the US, they, they don't understand and they're concerned about drift um, and how, how far this can go. I think that if, if um, there are some bills at the moment far too broadly drafted about um, right to be forgotten specifically and I think that they raise a lot of these concerns and dangers and I think it needs to be shifted back to what the core domain, who are those 500,000 plus people in Europe who are making requests, they're ordinary people, they are not they have no public profile and they're victims of algorithmic failure. They're not, you know, so that's what this is about. And this is about meaningful data protection rights so that the building blocks of my life, I have some degree of control when they, when they are used against me because somebody holding those keys to my life and using them wrongly can really affect you for a long time. So I think that th that's a really, um, it's probably a clarion call to the, um, the digital activists and academics to ensure that the core of this right is, uh, it, you may actually not need distinct legislation. I think these constitutional cases, um, it's important to think about what dimensions of that are positive. There's actually, I've, I found that the, the case law from the lower courts was actually very promising. It really sort of elaborated it effectively. And this case law from um, freedom of expression, positive case law, 150 to 200 cases now in Europe based on litigation from Google, which are very pro-freedom of expression. And those cases should reassure anybody who is concerned that what this right could do is exactly what you say, get um, allow politicians to sue ordinary internet users. That is not what's going on here. Those people are comprehensively being rejected in their requests, both by Google, by data protection authorities, by courts. And so I, I really don't think that's what this is about. But the, the essential thing is to bring back that humanity into the debate. And that's the thing that we all have a challenge. You know, the, that's this data set that's private. It's Google's data about what the core of these cases are. We continue to strive for getting that information out. And from there, I think we can build a case that people would understand in the course of things. In fact, probably if you talk to anyone, they think, oh, sure, you know, if they do a sweep and they get some inaccurate information, something that's really harmful, or something that just, it might not even be harmful, but it shouldn't have been there in the first place, that you should have some rights. So I think claiming that back to just what we all can understand, we can all understand youthful, you know, activities that you may want to move on from later, um, and just information that particularly is of a sensitive nature and uh, and really should should be s somehow not given the prominence that it is in, in Google search results. Thanks. Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you. Obrigado. Julia, até a próxima. <laughs>